Uh, I'm very happy to ha have you all here for my presentation today. Um, it's Music for Conservation, uh, session one, uh, it's uh, May 5th, and we're having Dr. Craig Willis uh, and Rain Hamilton featuring today, so. Usually, okay, sorry. Usually it works here. Oh, there we go. Okay, I just have a quick land acknowledgement. Um, I'm located in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, uh, Dakota, and Diné people, and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. Acknowledging this truth is important, yet only a small part in cultivating strong relationships with Indigenous communities. I'm dedicated to learning more about their history, culture, perspectives, and beliefs, as I know it will make us stronger individually and as a group moving forward into the future. So just some housekeeping. Um, while the presentation is on, um, or while the pre presenters, maybe keep your video off and your mute on. Um, and if the presenters want your video on, then it's totally cool. Um, actually, you can totally have that if you want. I can't see you. so. <laughs> Um, I'll also be recording the presentation for viewers just in case you missed it or would like to rewatch. So the quick outline for the presentation. Um, so I'm just going to do an introduction, a quick introduction to myself and how music for conservation got started. And then I'm going to introduce our presenters. We're going to have a wonderful performance by Rain Hamilton, a presentation by Dr. Willis and uh, Rain's second performance. And then a 10 minute Q&A if anybody has questions for any uh, either of them and then a gift card draw at the end and closing remarks. So a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Emily Thoroski and I am the environmental musician. I love science and I love art and I feel that combining um, them together is part of my purpose. I have a Bachelor of Environmental Science degree uh, from the University of Manitoba, and I'm currently working on my Master of Environment degree also at the University of Manitoba on uh, environmental communications. Um, I'm also a musician. I play guitar and I sing as a solo artist, and I love writing songs about the environment and more. So Music for Conservation, I had the idea to start this project about a year ago, and I've been over the last year trying to make it happen, and I'm very happy we're here today. Um, obviously, I have a very strong passion for conservation and music, but the project uh, is much bigger than me combining my passions. Um, music is a great tool to educate and inspire an audience. Uh, it also brings joy to many people's lives. Uh, studying the environment and watching what is happening uh, across the world is very devastating to witness, especially as a younger person. And for me, and I bet um, many others, music is the light. Um, I see music as the way of bringing people together and to make them feel excited and happy to listen and act on what they're um, hearing. So I personally feel that collaborating and communicating is a critical next step for moving forward um, uh, of, as all of us living on this planet. So I pitched the idea to the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada and they were um, happy to support me with a small fund to bring in biologists and musicians for you to hear and tonight, um, which is amazing. And then I'm proud to say that I'm partnering with the nonprofit organization in Manitoba called Discover Owls. And I'm very happy to work with Dr. James Duncan on, on that. So um, next, I'll just quickly do introductions to our presenters. So today, uh, Dr. Craig Willis is joining us, and he is a professor of biology at the University of Winnipeg, who has been studying the behavior, ecology, and physiology of bats for over 20 years. Research by him and his students on bat conservation and white nose syndrome has been covered by a range of national and international media, including CBC's The Current, The Quirks and Quirks, uh, CTV National News, uh, The Guardian, and The Los Angeles Times. Wow, I'm so excited to hear his presentation. Okay, and introducing Rain Hamilton. Rain is part uh, Prairie Songstress, part Story Weaver. Each song has a story delivered between songs with humor and grace. Rain invites deep love of the violin into the singer-songwriter genre, writing for violin and voice, as well as for guitar and voice, joined by cello and upright bass, 
expects string arrangements that push and pull that move as they console. So without further ado, I think I'm going to introduce my speakers and bring in Rain Hamilton to do her presentation. Hello, can you hear me, Emily? Yes, we can hear you. I'm going to try to spotlight you. Oh, cool. Yeah. So people can just see you. Okay, cool. I have you pinned. Oh, so much as possible. I love it. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. I think this is a great like two points to connect on uh, the biology and the music. I'm in. Yeah. That's uh, pretty cool. So I was thinking about what songs would make sense. And I have not written like a song expressly about bats. The closest I have is a song about geese, which I think like there's some points of comparison. They fly, they live here, they are cool. There's lots to learn from them. Um, and this song really shines a spotlight on the cooperation of the geese, which is just fantastic. And it's one of the many things um, that I think that humans can really learn from the natural world and from other creatures in it. Uh, so they're my role models for cooperation. They've got it figured out. This is called To the North. Let me just make sure, I forgot to check one audio setting and just to make sure original sound is on. And I'm remembering that that's important. It is, thank you so much. Original sound. Sorry team, I checked some other things and then I forgot about this one. Do you know offhand where that, oh, it's advanced, here we go. Uh, hmm. Okay, I think we're good. Let me know, please, Emily, if this is like going not what we expected. Yeah, so far I can hear you quite well. Okay, great. Okay, to the north. Go geese, go cooperating. <laughs> Birds on the skyline, an arrow to the north, and follow the water. The winter has forgiven, or oh, sunlight on its surface lights the way. Sunset turns to moonlight, miraculous wonder. Keep us as we lay our spent sails down. Well, my darling, we fall back. We're 
Amazing. <laughs> thank Yay. you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Everyone's applauding. <laughs> I'm pumped about the bats now. Yes, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Rain. You're welcome. Hi. Really appreciate it. Nice. You're getting some high fives. Very cool. Cool. So, um, Dr. Willis, if you would like to, I'm going to enable you to share your screen with us. All right. All participants. Okay. You should maybe try to share your screen now. It should work. Oops. Should work. Yep. And hopefully you're seeing the right one. Uh, just about, it says Craig Willis has started. Yes. There we go. Okay, great. Well, hi everyone. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, well, to Emily for inviting me to be part of this incredibly cool event. When uh, she mentioned uh, she you know, was running this program, I just thought it was the neatest idea and I was uh, really excited to uh, be asked to do it. So I'm very grateful to, to her for doing it. Um, and thanks to all of you for showing up, especially if you're in Winnipeg, the first nice evening of the year and you're on yet another Zoom meeting. It's amazing that you're willing to, to do that. And um, it's, it's great uh, to see some familiar names in the list. I'm totally happy if people want their cameras on. I've gotten used to teaching to undergrads online the last two years with black uh, squares. So uh, most happy, but, uh, but uh, obviously no pressure either. Um, and wonderful to hear Rain uh, play. This isn't the first time I've had the very difficult job of following a Rain Hamilton performance. Uh, I am actually a very amateurish musician myself. Here's me over here. Here's my awesome uh, duo partner, Dr. Angela Failer from Women and Gender Studies at the University of Winnipeg. And here's Rain. Here we are at uh, the sound check for my wonderful lab technician uh, and lab manager, Kaylee Norquay, for her wedding social. She's good friends with Rain and invited some of us to play. And I will never forget how kind and patient and encouraging Rain as the professional was with uh, our amateur bumbling, trying to get set up and do a sound check and get it all organized. And I consider it one of the highlights of my amateur musical life to have gotten to play a few tunes with her in front of other humans. So thank you for that, Rain. Uh, wonderful to hear you uh, perform tonight. Um, you'll be grateful to know I'm not going to do any music tonight. I'm going to stick to my day job and let the professional do the music. Uh, I'm going to talk about work my students and I have been doing uh, for the past uh, 10 years plus to try and understand a disease of bats that's uh, led to endangered status for multiple species in Canada uh, and soon uh, the US. Um, what we have done to try and understand this disease uh, and what we're doing to try and understand how we might help bat populations recover. And I think if you attend more of these sessions, you're going to learn if you don't know already, and many of you I'm sure do know, that doing environmental research, doing conservation work is a team effort. Uh, and that's certainly the case for the work I'm talking about tonight. Um, and so many students uh, and colleagues and other professors and, and uh, friends uh, have contributed to this work in important ways. So definitely want to acknowledge those folks. I've got two uh, sort of take home messages I want to try and leave you with tonight. Uh, maybe a third one too. The first two, uh, uh, really the first is that pathogens of wild animals can have impacts on their conservation status, can affect their populations in negative ways. Um, we've gotten used to thinking about the pathogens of wild animals and the relative of a pathogen of an Asian horseshoe bat uh, in the context of COVID in the last couple of years. And that's a topic for a whole other day. It's also a conservation issue the concern about spillover of wildlife pathogens to people. Um, but what we work mostly on uh, are, is a pathogen that, uh, that really causes problems for the, the wild animal population and not so much the human population, at least not directly. So I want to try and convince you that wildlife pathogens can affect the conservation status of wild animals. I also want to try and leave you with the idea that 
Yes, cures for diseases can be kind of complicated. They can involve uh, vaccines or they can involve um, uh, various other kinds of uh, chemical treatments. But one cure for at least uh, this conservation pathogen that I'll talk to you about tonight could be as simple as just protecting and improving the critical habitats of these animals in ways that help their populations recover. Uh, also, third take home message, I'm hoping I can convince you that bats, like geese, as Rain just told us, uh, are very cool and interesting. So conservation pathogens. Uh, there is growing appreciation that microbial pathogens, so bacteria and viruses and fungi, uh, can cause devastating effects for populations of all sorts of wild animal species. Uh, a few recent examples from among many, sea star wasting disease is uh, one that's cropped up in recent years. We're not totally sure what's causing it. It's been sort of connected to a virus, but uh, there's no real smoking gun. Uh, but what happens to sea stars with this disease is their bodies basically disintegrate over time. And it seems to be associated with uh, warming ocean waters associated with climate change. That's a worry because, believe it or not, sea stars are often very important predators in intertidal ecosystems that structure whole ecological communities. So if we lose them, we can have big problems in uh, those intertidal zones uh, uh, on our coastlines. Uh, another very well-known one is amphibian chytridiomycosis. As far as we know, this has caused uh, the fastest decline in wild animal biodiversity that's ever been observed. Uh, multiple species of frogs have gone extinct because of this fungus in the last 25 or so years. This fungal pathogen can survive in the water it, without frogs, but when frogs are there, it infects their skin, causes a whole bunch of uh, physiological changes that uh, kills many species. And again, humans have had an effect here. We've made this worse by moving frogs and moving water from place to place. And that's really helped this thing spread. Uh, of course, the one we work on most in the bat lab at the University of Winnipeg is this horrible disease of bats, this white nose syndrome caused by a fungal pathogen that infects exposed skin of the bats. <laughs> and so I'll get into uh, what this is doing to bats in a few minutes. Before we do that though, I think it's worth talking a little bit about why we ought to care about bats. And I think one important reason we should care about bats, as we should care about geese, and as we should care about all sorts of aspects of the natural world, is simply because we're human beings. We love art and music, uh, and we're curious about nature because these are human things uh, to do, right? Uh, and so I think studying bats, investing money to study bats is a worthwhile thing to do simply because they're a cool and interesting part of the natural world. Um, few cool factoids about bats. We could spend a long time. I could nerd out for, uh, for ages. I'll try and regulate myself a little bit. One of the cool facts about bats is how they're flying. Very different from how our geese and other birds fly. Uh, the architecture of the wing is totally different. So here we're looking at an Australian Eastern horseshoe bat. Here's its forearm. Here's its hand. These long skinny bones are fingers. And the scientific word for bat actually comes from the Greek for hand wing. This is a little thumb poking out the leading edge of the wing. Um, and so you can imagine if you were a bat, you'd have very long skinny fingers. You'd have a flap of skin coming from the end of your pinky down to your ankle. Your hips would be flipped around backwards. So your knees face the same direction as your butt. And then you've got another flap of skin connecting your two hind feet. So you can actually scoop up insects in uh, that, basically that tail membrane, right? That ability to fly under their own power with their hands has led to an incredible diversification of this group of mammals. Uh, most of uh, the mammals in the world are either a rodent or a bat. There are about 2,500 rodent species and about 1,400 different bat species, way more than any of the other groups of mammals. There are, uh, there's a, really a bat for every occasion. Uh, most of this diversity occurs in the tropics. We have six species of bats in Manitoba. 
Uh, but uh, in the tropics, there are species that have these amazing resonating chambers on the heads of the males, so they can make sounds that are intoxicating to females during the mating season. There are bats that have tubes on their noses that we don't really understand. Crested bats, bats with bizarre and elaborate nose leaves. There's our very handsome wrinkle-faced bat. No one's really sure why they're so hideously ugly. Uh, but uh, they're uh, amazing in their own right. There are bats with suction cups on their wrists so they can hang on the inside of uh, furled up leaves and use those as roosts in tropical forests. So incredible array of different species and bats occur everywhere in the world where there are trees for them to roost in. So they're incredibly widespread. Their biology is also just kind of weird for relatively small mammals. Uh, so. Uh, I like to think of them more like miniature flying grizzly bears. Uh, many people confuse them with flying mice, but they're a whole lot more in terms of their biology like a much larger mammal. For one, they can have massive home ranges. A hoary bat, this is a Manitoba species that flies south for the winter uh, and roosts in the foliage of trees. So they seem to be reasonably common in the city of Winnipeg in the forest and, and throughout Manitoba. Um, they uh, uh, can fly huge distances in a night um, and uh, travel very long distances with big home ranges. Bats also have bizarrely long lifespans for tiny mammals. So these are uh, Manitoba little brown bats. This uh, individual, I took this photo of these two little cuddlers in a cave during hibernation uh, in 2010. And uh, a biologist from the Manitoba Museum put this blue band on its forearm in 1989. So this bat was nine grams and 21 years old when I took this picture. The age record for this species is about 40 in the wild. So they live an incredibly long time and we're still not totally sure how they're able to do that, right? So their biology is just weird. They're also cool because they're musicians. They're sort of musicians. They certainly rely on sound like musicians. They, uh, as they're flying around at night, echolocating bats are screaming out these uh, high intensity calls that are incredibly loud, about as loud at the bat's mouth as standing underneath the engine of an airplane as it's taking off. Um, and then they're listening for echoes bouncing back from objects in the environment like an insect they're targeting to eat, right? We can't hear these calls with our ears because they're much higher pitched than our range of hearing, but conveniently there are now basically handheld recording studios so we can hear these musicians in action. Um, there's an app for your iPhone or iPad. The app's free. You got to pay for the microphone, a few hundred bucks for a microphone um, that allows you to convert the sounds bats are making into recorded calls that we can use potentially to identify species. We can't always tell species apart, but often we can based on characteristics of their call recordings. And so I wanna play you, I think I shared my sound properly, uh, but maybe someone just let me know if you don't hear this. This is the sound uh, uh, made by a bat detector, one of these microphones converting the sound into something that we can hear. Oops, hopefully you can hear that. Tick, tick, tick. So that's the sound an echolocating bat makes as it's just traveling through an area. It's not really doing anything interesting. It's sort of commuting from place to place. It gets a little more interesting when a bat detects a target like an insect. Uh, and see if you can spot the difference in. You can hear that sound. I'll play it one more time. I can. So that sound are the individual echolocation calls getting shorter and closer together. So the bat gets more information back more quickly from its target. Uh, that's so the insect can't escape, right? 
Um, and because of the way it sounds, I like to refer to them as feeding attempts of rapid tempo. See if you can work out that acronym, feeding attempt of rapid tempo. As uh, bat biologists, if we hear lots of those calls, we know we're recording in an area where bats are feeding. We know that could be important foraging habitat. And that's useful information for us to know. So some cool, uh, some of the many cool factoids about bats. Uh, if that's not enough to convince you bats are worth caring about, they're also ecologically and economically important. We know they're worth billions of dollars for agriculture in North America. Some of the best evidence for this comes from exclosure studies over corn crops in the central US. Uh, basically scientists went out and put big nets over a bunch of cornfields at night, took the nets down during the day. So prevented bats from foraging on crop pests, but allowed birds to forage normally. And what they found was a big increase in damage to the corn uh, made by insect larvae, uh, they found more diseases in the corn spread by insects. The farmers would have to spend more money on pesticides, causing the associated problems there. Uh, and so the costs of this were uh, incredibly large. Um, there's a recent study also showing that the bats we lost from our disease, from white nose syndrome, uh, has cost us a lot of money for agriculture in the U.S. Uh, so uh, they're important ecologically and economically. Now, I mentioned uh, that some of our bats uh, hibernate in caves, our cuddling little brown bats, and these are the ones I'm going to focus on uh, most today, not our migratory species that fly south. In Manitoba, we've got three hibernating species, and two of these are in real trouble because of our fungal disease. Okay. Um, this is an amazing hibernation site in central Manitoba, kind of near the Paw, near where Kent is. Um, and each of these little dark spots is uh, a, a cuddle or snuggle of bats. Some people call them clusters. I like to call them cuddles. And you can see all these individuals all huddling together as they hibernate for the winter. Our little brown bats in Manitoba go into hibernation in September, and some of the males don't come out until June. So they spend most of their lives underground hibernating uh, and living only on a little bit of stored fat. Uh, because, as we know, in the winter there's not much to eat. Uh, this is a great time to go and survey for bats if we do it very occasionally so we don't disturb them once per year, maybe twice a year. We'll go in, we'll photograph all the bats, and then we count all the noses in our photographs so we have an idea of uh, the bats we can find in our hibernation sites. Um, folks do this all across North America, and in 2007, uh, biologists doing this work in New York State were appalled to discover instead of bats cuddling on the ceiling, scenes that look like this. Carpets of thousands, tens of thousands of dead bats on the floors of several caves, uh, little carpets of skeletons, uh, and a few survivors with this white stuff all over them. And so these biologists quickly raised the alarm and wondered what we were dealing with uh, folks worked out pretty quickly that the white stuff was a fungus, and we now call this Pseudogymnoascus destructans, or PD. Uh, it's cold tolerant, so it grows beautifully between about 4 and 14 degrees. It can't grow above 20 degrees, so you and I can't get it because our body temperature is much too warm. But it seems superbly adapted to grow in the cold skin of a hibernating bat. And that's where it grows. It grows in the skin, uh, in the exposed skin of the wings and the face, hence white nose syndrome and the ears. And that's the only place it grows. It doesn't invade other tissues. It doesn't cause a systemic infection. It simply infects the skin. And so a, a kind of longstanding question was, how does a simple skin infection end up killing thousands and to date millions of bats across North America? Well, uh, to understand that, we did some experiments early on to try and understand what was happening to bats with the disease. Uh, and we first observed, as others did, that it was making a mess of their wing skin. Uh, this is a cross section through a little piece of a bat's wing showing a healthy, happy wing uh, section of wing tissue. This black stuff is the epidermis, so it's intact, the outside of the skin, 
And there's a whole lot of blood vessels and uh, a few little muscles in that delicate uh, wing membrane. The wings of bats are really physiologically active. So they pump tons of blood through them. They've got lots of blood vessels. And they actually, especially doing, during hibernation, they breathe a little bit across their wings. They do some gas exchange across their wings. Uh, what happens in infected bats is they get lesions. The whole wing doesn't look like this, but they'll get sections of the wing where all of these little squiggles of fungus break open the epidermis. This is all fungus growing on the surface. This is a mess. It's swollen. Uh, it's got fungus in the tissue. And what's going to happen with a wing like this is it's going to leak fluid. It's kind of like the injury that a severe burn victim might experience, we think. Um, and the wings end up looking like a mess. Um, they, you don't really see these lesions with the naked eye, but the texture of the wing is, is different. It's not, uh, it's not the nice, healthy, smooth wing of the uninfected bat. Uh, that still doesn't explain why these animals are dying in droves with this simple skin infection. Uh, to understand that, we attached little temperature recording backpacks to bats, to healthy bats and to infected bats. Uh, and we plotted their body temperature during hibernation. Okay. So what I've plotted here is about three months of hibernation for uh, a healthy individual. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is the skin temperature of that bat over time um, at a very low temperature for us, this is about seven degrees, right? So above freezing, but still cold, this saves a hibernator. Bats and rodents that hibernate also do this saves them a ton of energy. It allows them to survive for eight months on a couple of grams of stored fat. But there's something about being a mammal and being cold for very long periods that are incompatible. And so every few weeks they rewarm to a normal body temperature for a couple of hours. They spend a ton of energy to do this. Each of these little spikes to a normal body temperature costs them about three weeks of cold time. They burn through a ton of fat as they shiver to warm up and stay warm for a little while, while they presumably restore some aspect of their physiology that doesn't work when they're cold. Uh, so what happens to our infected bats? Well, we think because they're getting dehydrated and losing fluid across these lesions, eventually, although they start hibernating normally, by the end of hibernation, they're warming up about three times too often. Uh, and that means they're burning through way too much fat way too quickly, and they end up starving to death before spring. Uh, so that's uh, obviously a concern. Um, obvious question, where did this thing come from and why did it suddenly start killing North American bats? Well, once we saw big die-offs of bats in North America, we started looking in other places in the world for maybe a similar fungal organism. And this is a map of Eurasia showing all these little dark dots are where people have now found PD, growing happily on bats with no major die-offs of bats. Now, the evidence is now very clear that bats have co-evolved with the fungus in Eurasia for uh, thousands, tens of thousands of years at least. Um, we don't have any of the same bat species in North America, um, and so it seems this thing has accidentally arrived here and has found a naive host with no resistance to it. Okay. Uh, so it's everywhere across Eurasia. How it got here is a mystery that we'll probably never figure out, but there's some circumstantial evidence that, again, this is probably pathogen pollution, that people might have introduced it. One of the first sites in New York that was hit by White Nose Syndrome is a tourist site called Howe Caverns that gets tens of thousands of visitors per year. You can do lantern tours, you can do boat tours in this big cave. You can, if this is what you're into, you can get married in the cave. And so odds are uh, pretty good that someone was in a bat cave in the old world, in Eurasia somewhere, got some mud on their boots with this fungus in it, and then tracked uh, that, uh, that uh, invader into a site like Howe Caverns. We don't know that for sure. We probably never will but uh, that seems like a very likely scenario because we know that bats don't move back and forth between North America and Europe or Asia. Once it got here, what we do know is that it spread incredibly quickly. So here's an X on New York State. How Caverns was one of several caves that were 
discovered with the fungus in that first year, um, and it quickly spread over the next uh, 15 years or so, until now it's jumped across the Rockies. Uh, it's becoming established along the West Coast, well established now in Manitoba. We don't know where any bats hibernate in Saskatchewan, but the fungus has been found on bats in uh, the spring. So uh, we know it's there as well and, and continues to spread. Um, so where are we now? Well, we know that 20 species in North America have now been found with the fungus on them. They're infected. Uh, 13 of those are more or less affected. There's evidence their populations have declined. But there are seven others that just seem to be able to spread it around. They don't get sick. That makes this pathogen even a little bit more worrying. It can survive on resistant hosts um, who could spread it to highly susceptible hosts. We also know the impacts have been staggering. As far as we can tell, this is the fastest decline of wild mammals that's ever occurred. Millions and millions of animals have been killed. Three species are now endangered in Canada. One uh, so far is listed as threatened in the US, but others are being uh, considered for endangered status. And so uh, these plots from uh, a classic paper on white-nose syndrome show a couple of hibernation sites where people did those winter counts of bats. And what you see is the pre-white-nose population in the thousands for both of these sites, white-nose arrives and it crashes to very low levels, right? Where in these particular sites, it stayed. In some other sites, it seems to be starting to rebound a little bit, which is sort of encouraging. But in these ones, it's staying low. Part of the reason for that is the fungus does uh, really just as well whether there are lots of bats or not so many bats. Once the fungus is in a site, it can survive in the environment without bats. Even if all the bats are killed, the fungus can live in there potentially for years. And then if healthy bats come in uh, and try and sort of recolonize a hibernation site, a cave, they're going to get infected with the fungus that's left over. Those kinds of pathogens are especially worrying from a conservation perspective. Uh, uh, chytrid fungus for frogs is like that too. It can survive in the pond without the host there. So what we've learned about white-nose syndrome is that it's an invasive fungus from Eurasia. We have good evidence that dehydration across wing lesions is important, but most importantly, the fungus increases the frequency that they warm up throughout hibernation. And we know that it's spread easily by both susceptible species and resistant species and it can survive in caves without bats. Uh, this is bad news. Uh, if we wanna preserve our bat populations, none of this is especially good. So obviously what conservation biologists are interested in doing is finding solutions to environmental problems. And so we've been really focused on things we could do to maybe help up bat populations uh, uh, recover uh, and certainly avoid making the situation worse. One of the things that people started doing early on, once we were able to show really clearly that it was the fungus causing the die-offs, people were originally skeptical that it was the fungus and thought maybe it was something else going on with bat health and the fungus was a secondary infection. Once we showed it was the fungus, that really got people decontaminating their stuff. And we're still very careful about that, washing our boots, being careful about PPE, long before the average person knew the, what the initials PPE stood for, we were wearing it when we went into caves to survey for bats. Um, folks have also been working hard on potential treatments. The bats are spreading it uh, much more than we are, so cleaning our stuff is only going to help so much. And it's not going to stop uh, the major uh, crashes of populations. One of the things we tried reasonably early on was trying to treat one of the suspected symptoms of the disease, and that's dehydration. Um, we know that wildlife rehabilitation people, like savvy parents, if your young child has diarrhea, you might give them Pedialyte if they're getting dehydrated. If your, uh, um, your uh, injured deer or some injured animal comes into the wildlife rehabilitation facility and is dehydrated, often those folks will give Pedialyte as well, and we know it works to rehydrate bats. Um, we also know you can't feed bats during the winter. You have to train them to eat anything we could give them to eat. Um, that 
means handling thousands of bats and that's totally impractical. They're also not all that motivated to eat during hibernation, but they still drink and they'll drink from standing liquid in their hibernation sites. And so we wondered maybe we could just put a water trough of Pedialyte in a cave, would bats drink it and we'd treat that uh, dehydration and maybe we could get them back on track in terms of their hibernation. Well, when we did the experiment, this is the view with an infrared camera in the dark, looking down into a cage of bats that have white nose syndrome. Here's our water dish. Here's our Pedialyte dish. And guess where the bats hung out? They wouldn't take the Pedialyte. So this attempted treatment uh, was a bust. It didn't work. Another thing we've tried is uh, using UV light. Our fungus is superbly adapted to growing on bats that live in caves. So it can't take a suntan. Uh, it's got none of the DNA repair mechanisms it, uh, that many other microbes have to deal with uh, uh, genetic damage from UV. And so you can kill it in the lab in a Petri dish very easily with UV light. We did an experiment in an abandoned mine near Kenora where we tried to treat the actual walls of the mine with UV light to see whether we could kill the fungus and come back later and would the fungus be gone? So if bats came back in, would they be safe? And it didn't work. The fungus recolonized very quickly, even uh, areas where we'd killed it. Uh, uh, folks have also tried lots of other chemicals and other microbes that uh, uh, do a great job of killing or inhibiting PD in the lab. And so we're, what we're looking at in all of these pictures are on the left side, these are Petri dishes where our bat fungus is growing. And on the other side, we've got some uh, chemical or we've got uh, a bacterium, here Rhodococcus, a bacteria, here's Pseudomonas fluorescens, another bacteria that's inhibiting the growth of PD on the right-hand side. Okay. Uh, this one was particularly interesting to our collaborators and to us because this strain of this really common Pseudomonas bacteria, uh, folks had isolated from the wings of a resistant species. And when you put it in a Petri dish full of PD, you can see this area around the bacteria where it's killed off the fungus. So we wondered if we took this bacterium from healthy resistant bats and put it on the wings of susceptible bats, could we have a beneficial effect? Could we help those bats fight off the fungus? And this time it sort of worked. We actually in our lab experiment improved survival by about 30%. Uh, in a, a field trial, there's also some evidence it improves survival a little bit. Uh, so maybe there's some promise here. A couple of questions though. The first is, is 30% enough to really make a dent in the kinds of population crashes we're seeing? Second, and probably more importantly, uh, for much of North America, certainly this half of North America, we know there are lots of bats because we can catch them and we can listen for them in the summertime, but we don't know where they hibernate. So we couldn't go in and say spray bats with this pseudomonas stuff to help them fight off the, fun the fungus because we don't know where they are. Uh, many bats also hibernate in places that are inaccessible, tiny little cracks and crevices, or abandoned mines that are death traps for humans, so you can't get in there anyway. Um, so maybe this would work in some places, but it's certainly not gonna work everywhere. We started doing some more kind of first principles thinking about how we might help endangered wildlife populations recover. What else could we do? Well, if you harken back to these figures, I showed you these depressing declines down here. But as I said, we know in some places populations are recovering. And even in these devastated populations, there are still some bats left. There are a few bats left. And the odds are good, and in fact, there's now some pretty uh, good evidence to su support this idea, that those bats that are left have traits that help them make it through the winter. Maybe they were the bats that got fattest in the fall before hibernation. So they can take the, mo the most arousals. They can take those added arousals and still survive. Maybe there's some other aspect of their biology that's different. And if that uh, difference, those traits are heritable, 
they can pass those traits on to their offspring. And as uh, we support that population, we might see the evolution of resistance in our host that we're trying to protect. We actually call this evolutionary rescue in conservation biology. And so what we've really been focused on in my lab in the last couple of years is trying to improve the reproductive potential of survivors of white nose syndrome, of bats that presumably have heritable survival traits. A bunch of things we've been looking at, but just going to talk about one, and that is summer habitat. We got motivated to think about summer habitat because early on in the disease, uh, there was some effort to regulate activities of industry in the forest, to slow down uh, forestry, to slow down some mining operations because bats roost, uh, many bats roost in the forest. Um, the industry folks would come back and say something like, well, we're not hurting the bats, it's the disease. So cure the disease and let us continue about our activities, right? That always uh, sort of struck me as a little bit uh, uh, counterproductive uh, because we know summer habitat is going to be important for survivors. And we wondered if we could show how important it might be, not just uh, the good habitat that's there, but maybe enhanced habitat that we can make better. What's great summer habitat for mother bats raising their pups? Warm roosts. Warm but not too hot. Uh, that helps, that's going to help them recover from the infection with the fungus and going to help their pups grow faster and help them produce more milk during lactation, right? So we know many bats roost in trees, but many also roost in bat houses and buildings and people know where they are. And so we've sort of taken advantage of this knowledge of citizen scientists to make some progress. Uh, we wondered whether we could enhance summer habitat to help white nose syndrome survivors reproduce. And our enhanced habitat is a heated bat box. We took a standard bat house, we insulated it, we installed a heating mat and a thermostat. We set the thermostat to uh, about 30 degrees, which is a lovely comfortable temperature for little brown bats. They're not usually that warm, but they're warmer than unheated boxes. Um, and they lose a bunch of heat at the bottom, so they don't stay a perfect 30 degrees, but they're certainly warmer than the other sites the bats have available. We then used our citizen science website to find uh, willing participants to help us. So I'd encourage folks to check out the neighborhood bat watch. It's just batwatch.ca. Um, and this is a place where you can report observations of bats and where people that know about colonies of bats can count their bats for us, uh, report those counts. You can watch them emerge at dusk and uh, sit with a cool drink in, on a summer night. Great activity to do with the kids. Um, and give us some great data for monitoring bat populations. We have bat watchers, there are bat watchers all across Canada. We found uh, about 40, 39 in Manitoba and Northern Ontario that agreed to let us put either a heated or an unheated bat house right next to their existing colony. So we went around all these colonies, the yellow dots are heated bat house sites, and the dark dots are unheated control boxes. Uh, all these sites were white nose positive by 2019, so we're dealing with white nose positive bats. And we're so grateful to these gracious folks that let us put our experimental boxes. They've got, here's where our thermostats sort of housed safely. We attach them as close to the existing colony entrance as we can. And we do that so the bats have their original choice uh, but they have a new choice of a potentially warmer site if they want it. And we wanted to increase the chances uh, by putting them close to existing colonies that bats would find and use them. So what happened? Well, we've got a number of encouraging sets of results. I'm just going to show you a couple. And I'm going to show them as box plots, which are maybe kind of confusing graphs. But really, this is just showing the spread in our data. And the important uh, thing to focus on here is this dark line in the middle. This you can think of as the average or the median, okay? Uh, and so on the vertical axis here, I've got the mass of pregnant females that we catch at colonies uh, in early summer before they've given birth. The mass at our control colonies that just got a uh, an unheated box um, or didn't have a heated box at all is significantly lower than colonies that got one of our heated boxes. That suggests maybe the heated boxes are helping our bats recover from white nose syndrome faster 
and grow a bigger pup. Uh, the most important result, though, I think, is that we found a, a really dramatic effect on our rate of juvenile captures. Um, so here we've plotted the proportion of total, total captures in July. Once the pups start flying out of the roost, our proportion of captures that are juveniles. And so a value of 0.5 here equals about a one-to-one -one adult to juvenile ratio, right? And in our heated box, this uh, proportion of juveniles, uh, colonies that have access to a heated box, uh, many more juveniles, suggests that uh, this approach is helping bat colonies affected by white nose syndrome produce more pups and reproduce. So it seems like enhanced summer habitat can help bats recover and reproduce. Uh, what does this mean for conservation? Well, I don't think it means we should be putting heated bat boxes all across North America. Uh, there are reasons that this could actually make, uh, uh, well, it could have negative consequences because not all bat species are as likely to use a bat box as others. And some of our white nose affected species won't go in a bat box or will rarely use one. So we could disrupt the bat community that way. What, I, what we think it is, is an important example, uh, an important experimental evidence that shows summer habitats could be really important to helping populations recover. And so we need to do the expensive work to understand more about natural roosting and also feeding habitats of bats. That's the other area we're working on. Can we help bats get more to eat? And so kind of the main message I think of this experiment is that we need to identify and protect. And if we can enhance critical roosting and feeding habitats of bats, this could be just as important as figuring out some chemical we can spray on bats in a cave. And it's kind of the first principles thing that we do whenever a, a wildlife species is endangered. We identify critical habitats and we try and protect them and maybe make them better. So uh, I'll leave you with, again, these two sort of take home method messages. Um, clearly we've got a wildlife pathogen that's had a big conservation impact. Um, and uh, I think one potential cure for our conservation pathogen could be as simple as just uh, protecting and improving their existing habitats. And with that, I'm gonna thank you all for your attention. Thank a huge uh, cast of characters. And I'm very excited to hear another uh, song from Rain. And then I think we're gonna do some questions after. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Dr. Willis, that was amazing. I think everybody's virtually applauding right now, hey? <laughs> that was great, except I wish you had your guitar too. You could play a song for us. Let's leave that to the pro. <laughs> okay, um, so we're gonna have a, a, present, or a performance by Rain, and then we'll, we'll get into a Q&A. Um, so I'll try to highlight Rain so we can see her. Fabulous. Hello. Right on. Hi, Emily. Thank you. Uh, wow, thanks for all that information about bats and for researching bats and to bats for existing. I love this. Um, okay. Hearing all the bad information, I something came back to me, and that is that I did actually at one point write a song literally about bats. I had a job for many summers as a park interpreter where we would like write and perform like little plays and skits and stuff for campers to try and like help, you know, humanity interface with nature in like a more uh, productive way, rad, rad gig. And one summer, we were, my, uh, myself and my interpreter team together, we wrote a musical that was called Bears, Bats and Wolves, Oh My a tale of the interdependence of the boreal forest. So uh, one of the songs is sung by a bat and I just remember the beginning of it, but I mean like, this is a shockingly appropriate moment to share this song. So I'm gonna go for it. It's called, I am not a rat with wings. Craig, let me know if you concur. Well, I am not a rat with wings. I am a bat among other things. So now we're seeking 600 mosquitoes an hour. I am mosquito seeking power. That's all, that's all I remember. 
breakaway pop hit of uh, the summer, thanks to my sister Peggy Hamilton, who remembers. Now, Peg often remembers the words. So, Peg, if you remember more words, would you please type them in the comments? Uh, it's possible. So, I thought I would share this other song, which is called Brave Land. Uh, and I find that a lot of the art I am moved to make is really connected to place and to the natural world, which we are a part of. Um, I'll mention that this song is off my new record. The record is called Brave Land, and it's about all of this land business. Uh, and if you're interested in like where you could find that, you can order it on my website, rainhamilton.com. I'm also like on every surface of the internet. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here. So this one has like, a sing-along ooh component. So I'm gonna invite like, you know, to sing along as desired, to maybe like, I'm gonna encourage some ooing along in the comments. Later, if this gets unearthed as like an archeological find, people will be like, so many ghosts on this call. It goes, ooh, ooh, hi friends. Then it goes again, ooh. y'all are invited to sing that one that comes up if anyone feels like they have like a true soprano range and could really like shut one out echolocation style for the bats i support you all right a song for being alive which i recommend wow we are part of this beautiful interconnected world born one day breathing gifted these feet that walk the earth Tread stepping lightly, the earth as our body and our lover. And I've never known a life this life before. Brave land of preaching, sit with me and lift me to the sky that I might hear you. Covered in crystal, oh holy mantle, where the sun is set. And I've never known a light this light before. Okay, ooze.
Let's ooh again. Thank you. Thank you. Splendid ooing. Amazing rain. Thank you so much. Great on. Thanks so much. What a delight. And thanks so much for inviting me. It's a lot of fun. I loved how you got the audience into it. <laughs> Very cool. Um, everyone's applauding. Amazing. Yay. Um, so we'll start our Q&A session. We're a bit over time, but if you guys can stay, that's great. Um, I scheduled the, the Zoom till 8.15, so I hope it doesn't take me off there, but I don't think it will. Um, but let's get into our Q&A. If anyone has questions for either Rain or Dr. Willis, uh, please come up and or say it, or you can put it in the comments and I can say it for you. We see a hand, uh, Thoroski. Do you want to say your comment, John? <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah, it's me. Um, very uh, a great presentation. Very interesting. I, it's wonderful to hear about bats. Um, I have, I have lots of questions. Um, my first one is just the situation here is that it's not good, you know, with the um pathogen on the bats and i'm just asking what would be the consequences if all the bats died yeah that that's a great question i think uh it depends on the species so one of the most affected species that we've now listed as endangered uh was previously probably the most common and widespread bat in north america and now it's just been devastated um there are a couple of studies that that have, you know, environmental economists have actually quantified the loss of ecosystem services that we've suffered because of that. Uh, one of them's just come out and I haven't fully unpacked it yet, but there's one uh, from the U.S. that shows in counties where you lose, uh, in counties where white nose syndrome shows up, they compare to nearby counties where it wasn't and there's an increase in uh, agricultural pesticide use the year after the bats die, and there are detectable health effects in, the, in the, those human populations. So, so that's one thing that we lose. Uh, we're not gonna lose all bats because of, uh, because of white nose syndrome. There's one species that I'm worried is going to go extinct for sure. Um, the, the, the thing that worries me the most is that there are these 1,411 species of bats. Um, most of those have a name and we don't know much else about them. The ones we have studied pretty well, most of those don't seem to be doing especially well. And some others are tanking for other reasons. So our migratory species are in trouble, largely because of loss of forests and wind energy, sadly, kills hundreds of thousands of migratory bats every year. Um, we got our fungus to worry about. We've got uh, habitat loss as for all sorts of other wildlife. And the insect eating bats are also dealing with the insect apocalypse that some people might have heard about recently. Insect populations are crashing all over the world. So <laughs> I oscillate between optimism and despair, like many conservation biologists. And uh, uh, yeah, I think that's just where we are. Okie doke. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so our next comment is in, uh... Our next question is in the comments. Brenda, is the fungus in the caves attracted to the warmth of the bat's noses? Great question. I, uh, we don't think so. We think it just gets on the skin and wherever it touches the skin, it starts to grow. Uh, it might like the humidity from the bat's noses, but their noses actually aren't warm when, it, they're grow when the fungus is growing. They're like basically slightly above cave temperature. So these animals are very cold for most of the time. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so Judy says, are the pups from infected bats born sick? Great question. The, 
weird and wonderful thing about the fungus is that if uh, bats survive the winter with the disease, they come out in the spring and then they're warm a lot of the time and their roosts are warm. So they clear the infection pretty completely. And if they survive long enough, uh, and certainly if they're able to produce a pup, uh, they're reasonably healthy by the time they're producing that pup. So they don't seem to spread it to pups in the summertime. Uh, where, where the pups get it is when they go into their first hibernation in the cave, then they get infected. Okay, um, next question is, James Duncan, what type of bat box is the most appropriate appropriate for bats in addition to conserving habitat? And are there plans available to build them? Awesome question. Uh, thanks for that, Jim. Uh, I'm gonna suggest that right after you go to Rain's website and order her album, that you go to batwatch.ca uh, and we've got plans there. Uh, if you Google Bat Conservation International for bat house plans, there's good plans there. Ours are sort of better suited to Canadian um, uh, situation. Um, you know, in some places in the States, it can get too hot in a bat house. It's in Manitoba, it's pretty hard to get too hot. Um, but in some parts of Canada, they can get too hot. So um, yeah, check out those sites and there definitely are plans available um, on, the, on the web that are good. Very cool. Um, so we have one more in the comments that says, do you think conservation efforts will be more focused on habitat protection over finding traditional cures? Um, example, antifungals, biological controls. I, I hope so. Um, that's what we've been working on. And I, I, uh, I think uh, that uh, our work and others has kind of helped to move the needle. So <clears throat> when I first started working on white nose syndrome in like 2008, there were a handful of us that got together in a crusty hotel in Albany, New York to try and brainstorm about what was going on. That group has now grown and like everything, it's been shut down in the pandemic, but hundreds of people across North America now go to the white nose syndrome conference and are working on this. Um, and uh, lo lots of those people, I think for a while, there was a big push to cure the disease. So find a treatment, find a cure. And part of that, like I said, was driven by industry and U.S. politics. Most of the funding has come from the U.S. Um, and there, you know, there were some people reluctant to make the northern long-eared bat the next spotted owl. They didn't want to have that issue. And so they, uh, they basically wanted the funding to focus on cures for the disease. Um, and a number of us thought, well, maybe that's what we should be doing, but we shouldn't put all our eggs in that basket. Um, and so that's something that we've been uh, trying to balance out. There, there actually is a pretty promising vaccine um, that, uh, and folks are working on a, a vaccine for the fungus that bats might be able to groom off their fur. So you find them as they're going into hibernation or you spray it on them even in the summertime and they just groom it off and eat it. Um, so there's a, that, that one might have some promise. Uh, there's not going to be one silver bullet solution though for this thing. It's a complicated problem. We're going to need lots of tools to sort it out. Okay, Lisa has her hand up. Hi. Um, we have always been just kind of interested in bats, like we're not scientists whatsoever, but um, we just moved outside of the city in the last uh, year and we live uh, yeah, just outside of Winnipeg and we've noticed there aren't bats at all and are wondering, can one attract bats somehow? Like we were going to buy a bat house and or build one and... Um, we just thought, does that make any sense that there are no bats around? And if there aren't, my husband keeps joking, can, are there mail order bats that we can find? And he's kidding, uh -huh. but, but can one do something to attract bats? The, the things they seem to like are uh, some forest nearby, uh, a source of fresh water and an abundant supply of insects. So like big picture, it's kind of habitat restoration to your own small backyard attracting bats is not, I don't think it's something that really works. Um, that said, you, they might be around. It never hurts to try putting up a good bat house in a good place. And at worst, it's a conversation piece with your neighbors. Um, at best, maybe you get lucky and get some. 
Um, but uh, yeah, that's we get that question a lot, and I wish you could put out a an attractant. Um, doesn't seem to be something that's that's workable. Okay, uh, are there any more questions? I think that seems to be good in the chat. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Craig Willis for being here and and Rain. Um, I have the. You guys can hear me, yeah. Okay, good. I have the fifty dollar uh, Visa gift card draw to do, and I have everyone's name down on this uh, app of mine. So I'm just gonna spin that, and we're gonna get a winner. Okay, so we have Amanda. Amanda, you have won. So um, if you're still here, that's great. Um, I'll contact you and then we can set up, uh, I'll mail the gift card too. Um, but lastly, just uh, I'd like to say thank you so much to Rain and Dr. Willis for being here. It was wonderful. Um, and thank you to the Jane Goodall Con uh, uh, Institute for helping me fund the project and uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Duncan for helping me uh, get the project um, off the ground for, with Discover Owls. And so just lastly, I just have one more thing to share before we leave. I do have, okay, wait, just because, okay. I do have two more presentations for this initiative happening next week. Um, one is uh, Monday, May 9th, and that's a virtual. So just email me for the Zoom link. And then the last one will be on Saturday at Okamic Marsh uh, from one to two. So you have to just register on the website if you wanna join us then. Um, but I hope to see you guys again, and thank you so much for joining. That's it. <laughs> Bye. Thanks so much. <laughs>